Okay. okay. And I just click got it. Okay. Doug, why uh, we're going to start off. off with, we're going to start off with a roll call of board members, and then, and then whatever members are on the phone, we'll ask you to introduce yourself as well. Uh, board members, starting with board members, uh, I'll start with Joe Baselli. I'm here. All right, uh, Maxine Maxine Lewis. Maxine, I know you're here. Here. Okay, there you go, Max. Um, uh, Duncan Cameron. Duncan is coming on, so he'll be coming on in just a moment. Um, who else do we have? Uh, Terry Copeland is not attending, I don't believe. Terry, are you here? Terry indicated he's probably not attending. And uh, Hans Gurenberg has a medical. Uh, Hans, are you here? No. We have a quorum as soon as Duncan joins. Uh, actually, I think we have a quorum. We have a quorum without Duncan. We have three of the five. Um, so let's start with the business session. Um, Joe, you want to handle the treasurer's report? Tell me yes, how much sir. money we got. I'll, I'll, I'll start with it and then I'll pass it on. Uh, but real quickly, just so everybody gets an overview of what we're going to cover. So we just did the roll call and we're going to do the treasurer's report. We'll go through old business. Some really interesting stuff going on between the Naples Beach Hotel, as well as um, you were all kind enough to, uh, many of you were kind enough to participate in a survey that we did uh, regarding the buildings. So we're going to present the findings from that. And then under new business, uh, most of you are aware, but maybe you're not, the Manor House was bought. So exciting news there. Uh, we've already heard a little bit about the NCH uh, proposed medical campus. So they're looking to rezone their area. There's an art district as well that's working on some things. And then we want to be sure to talk to you about the Naples City Council candidates debate. And then lastly, cover off on collaboration, collaboration and subjects. So, but we did the quorum, but I do want to throw out there we need, just as highlighted here, we need new board members. Um, so if you're interested, it's a great opportunity to shape what the Gulf Shore Property Owners Association works on. We have some weight where we can get city council members to talk to us. We chose not to do it here because we've got the election coming up and we thought it might be a little controversial, but you know, keep all that in mind. So real quickly, do we we'll we'll hold off on the self introduction. So the bottom line is, with regard to finances, we've got about sixteen thousand dollars in the bank, um, which is good. We've got a lot of money in the bank. Uh, annual dues are about one hundred fifty dollars per condo or co op. We've got about thirty five potential members. Um, we just lost a member, hopefully temporarily, with the Manor House eventually being sold and being torn down. So uh, something will come in its place though and hopefully we'll be able to attract them. In general, we're pretty frugal with the expenses. Our, you know, we have a minor financial bookkeeping expense, a minor website expense, and then we are co-sponsoring the council debate. So there's a little money there. But uh, I wanted to kind of just throw it out there to everybody. One of the things that Doug's been kind of thinking about is, you know, sometimes we're really chasing people down for their annual dues. It's not a lot of money, but would it change things if we asked for it and we took credit cards for it? Again, typically we don't charge, like we're not an HOA with homes, so we're not charging individual. It's typically for your condo building you know, and that's sort of, uh, for your whole building, not for an individual person in the building. Okay, before we go into discussion of credit card, Jane, are you on the line here? I am. Okay, Jane is our bookkeeper. Uh, our company is called Balance Books, and she does bookkeeping for us, for the Moorings Property Owners Association, and myriad other people. Jane is a really, real big asset for us. Jane, uh, on the matter of credit cards, we have talked about this before. 
if we have members that want to pay by credit card, would that be acceptable to you? Are you easy to accommodate that? Yes, and we have the PayPal account set up. So that's that's the way we're going to facilitate um, having invoices paid. Uh, so they, so I, it, using PayPal from, from what I, I haven't used it with my other clients, but using PayPal is kind of a secondary way of invoicing. So when I invoice, when I prepare and email the invoices out, yeah, well, I will include, I'll include a yeah. question with regards to correct, anyone that wants to I pay by I, PayPal. I think I put the alarm on. Yeah, I'll tell you in a second. Somebody needs to mute. Yeah. Jane, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. So I will begin emailing invoices out towards the end of next week, and I'll include a question in my email asking for anyone that would prefer to, prefer to pay by credit card. And if so, then I will generate a PayPal invoice and send it that way. Um, and anyone that asks for that can pay by credit card rather than mailing a check. Now, we talked about the fact that that's going to cost the association some money. Um, we talked about putting a $10 premium on that which would just cover the expenses of the transaction on your time. Right. So that would make the annual dues for the person who wants to pay by credit card $160. Is that what we're gonna say? Correct. Correct. Did you hear me? Yeah, okay. got it. We did. Okay, so just be aware, we are gonna open it up for credit card payment, $10. Anything else you wanna cover off on, Jane? We had uh, one or two, uh, no, more than that. Three condos that were tardy or late from 2021? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was thinking three or four. Um, okay. and, and this will be based, this will be up to your directive with me if I should resend 2021 outstanding invoices with 2022, or am I going to move forward and start over with 2022? This is always a question mark because um. there's there's always yeah, so, a few that so we'll, lag. We'll take it offline uh, and discuss that a little bit. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> other than that, I don't have anything. Okay. okay. Anybody have any other comments or anything? Questions? I don't know how many are online right now, but I just let me mention my email address. And perhaps some of my emails go into spam or they're just not recognizable. But my email address is jane at balancebooksnaples.com just for familiarity can you chat that in as well uh on the chat um i know how to i don't <laughs> use zoom very often is do i hit this pencil uh no hit the chat on the top it's like a little it's at the bottom it could be on the bottom or the top depending on where you bottom. put your toolbar i got mine oh, on there the it top. Is. yep perfect okay, okay very good Okay, so that's the story with the finances. Let's keep it moving. So old business, communications, Naples Beach Hotel, survey results, and some comments from Craig. So I think everybody knows, but if you don't know, the Naples Beach Hotel closed on November 8th. This is uh, from a press release. So the Watkins family has closed on the sale. Uh, it sold for $362 million. So both Doug and I were surprised. We thought that was a small number considering how large uh, amount of land they're getting and the development that's going in. But the first phase- $362 million for the beach club. Yeah. And, and so the first phase is going to include 58 beachfront house, residences um and four penthouses 12 golf side residences and overall they're going to have 185 residences and a luxury hotel so most of you know that i don't have an update from october 5th but most of you know that jeffrey fridkin uh, was in had a lawsuit um basically he feels like he's got standing with regard to the construction, and he feels like he should be able to have more influence on what's being built. Uh, so 
the Watkins family, they have Jeffrey Friedkin, I'm sorry, it was Gregory Myers who's got the lawsuit. Um, so the Watkins lawyer uh, basically said, I'm going to change. He's just going to ask for a summary judgment in favor of the Watkins family. I'm assuming that now that the Athens group is closed, it either was settled or the Athens group is now going to take this on. I was actually surprised to not hear that the lawsuit was settled because my thinking was, gee, they're probably waiting for the lawsuit you know, to be settled before they will close. But there also, I'm sure, were a lot of end of the year considerations um, for this. So that's what we've got with regard to that. Well, they Don't you want to talk? Sold that's, that's cheap. Yeah, I think it's really inexpensive in the big scheme of things, considering what's going to go in its place. But, you know, there is maybe there's some things that weren't publicly disclosed. Maybe there's some debt they're, they're retiring. Certainly, there were some legal fees. Maybe they paid some of the Watkins family's legal expenses. Who knows? Um, but it does seem like a relatively small number. And you'll hear more later on this call. Doug's got some interesting information that he'll share with you on another property that sold. So, Doug, do you want to talk a little bit about collaboration? So we do have a website that's up, gspoanaples.org. And we've often thought it'd be great to post like topics for discussion, things about what's your favorite restaurant, you know, hopefully not too controversial things. We're going to stay out of politics. Uh, I think there's enough on that elsewhere. <clears throat> But, you know, we could even use it for units for sale or rent. Thoughts? Anybody want to add to that? Let me jump in. Let me jump in for just one second. Uh, the idea of co collaboration and communication is what we have been talking about for several years now. And we're looking for a better way to be able to communicate between uh, buildings within the association and managers of those buildings or presidents of those buildings or board members of those buildings with things that they have to determine. One of our members recently talked about uh, intaking, intake water pipes, the water pipes that come into the building and how to replace them and the importance of having to do that. And that was posted up on the website. Uh, we need more people to visit the website. We need more interaction of each of, uh, each of us be more interactive with each other to be able to respond to those questions and be able to post our own questions. And that'll make it a, a more valuable tool. Thank you. Okay, so with that, here's a perfect segue to collaboration. We just did a survey. And we got about 35 responses, actually 33 once we took out the duplicates, the two duplicates. <clears throat> and we conducted this survey in the months of October and November. And this is a prime example of collaboration and sharing information. So we asked you some basic questions. This just sets it up for you. <clears throat> if you can read it, you can move your toolbar so that you can read this chart. But the bottom line is, about, I was surprised. I thought we'd get more responses with lower uh, buildings, building heights. But uh, we had quite a few responses from the six to nine uh, floors, a few more than nine stories, and then quite a few, obviously 19% less than three stories. And this obviously colors the survey results, right? So not quite two thirds have tall buildings, but it's certainly a, an important starting point for this whole discussion. Uh, so, Joe, yes. Joe, this is Craig. I, I thought maybe instead of going back through the slides, maybe give me a, a second or two after each slide and I Perfect. could add my comment. Okay, good, yeah. You wanna go back this, to the last one? Sure. Yeah, this is Craig Willey. Craig Willey is with the city of Naples and he's with the permitting department. 
Yeah, Craig, this, is, this is Craig Millay, and I'm the chief building official and the director of building services. So we do all the permitting inspections here in the city. Um, if, if we look at what may be the new uh, rules and regulations coming out of Tallahassee, they probably are going to affect buildings that are over three stories. So depending on how many members you have in your association and buildings over three stories, they could and very well may be affected by this new legislation. Okay, interesting. So those of you with buildings that are four stories, too bad. <laughs> um, so I think this is also very important to consider. How old is your building, right? Um, if it's relatively new, we'll work on the assumption that it's probably more up to date with regard to codes and stuff. But the older buildings, like the Naples Beach Hotel and others. So we've got 11% that were built before 1960, 14% built between 1960 and 64, <clears throat> 65 to 70 almost half of the buildings. So really, when you think about it, <clears throat> our buildings are like 50 years old. 20%, 71 to 79, and 6% after 1989. Yeah, Joe, that, this, is, this is also good information too. Uh, when they do uh, pass any new laws or regulations, it's going to be for buildings that are 30, and 40 years old when you need a structural assessment. It, they could go down to 25, but probably starting at 30 to 40. So a lot of your buildings are gonna need the, the structural assessment if that law gets passed. Okay, time to get your reserves in order, <laughs> budget for them. So we asked our survey respondents how concerned are you about having an independent engineering assessment mm -hmm. review? And as Craig just said, you may be lawfully, you may be required to do it. Bottom line is about 11% are uncertain, 17% have no concern. Again, that could be buildings that are two stories or less, so may not be impacted by this, but over half are somewhat concerned and 17% are very concerned. So here's one that also would affect the last question. Have you, oops, sorry, jumped. Have you conducted an independent engineering assessment review of the structural condition of your buildings. So 57% yes, 34% no, 9% uncertain. Yeah, Joe, this is another good uh, item here. You know, as a building official, we'd like to see uh, every taller building uh, get an independent engineering assessment. So to see that you got 57%, yes, that's a good number. We'd like to see it higher, but that's a great number. That, that shows me that we have HOAs out there that are, are very concerned and they're doing the, the due diligence to get those assessments done. And the sooner you get them done, the sooner you can make repairs if there's some needed and the less it will cost. Right, now let's put this into some context as well. When was the last assessment done? So 15% over five years ago. I think the world probably changed with the collapse in Miami <clears throat> in terms of some of the things they'll be looking for, but 20% one to five years ago. Wow, 60% within the last year, that's good. 5% don't know. Yeah, I'd like to see that number too. 60% is a great number. Um, and I, I hope there's, a, there's many people who are gonna move together and, and have more surveys done. So um, that's a really, really great number to see. And 
I don't want to go too far off on a tangent, but I was at a GSAC meeting. That's the uh, HOA north of Doctors Pass, and they were saying they attended a meeting, and one lawyer suggested one option that you could do is you could have the engineering assessment and have it submitted to your lawyer. It sounded to me a little questionable, though, legally. The idea was that that could potentially insulate <clears throat> the board from the perspective of, okay, now we don't have to disclose it because it's with our lawyer. And sometimes you have attorney client privilege, but that didn't seem to me, and as well as the person that presented it, didn't seem like a very wise approach. So this one also puts it into context. When do you plan to complete an independent engineering assessment? 13%, and again, this survey was conducted in the month of October and November, said we plan to do it by the end of the year. Another 13% said we're going to get to it next year. A large number said, hey, we're still evaluating if we should do it. 40% there, 20%, we don't have any plans to do it. Again, that could be because they've done it already. And 13% unclear. Yeah, this is, you know, this is hard to evaluate, but uh, I, if you look at 66% at are at least looking at it or are planning it, that's, that's pretty good. So we're happy with that. Okay, so inevitably, if you're gonna do an assessment, you're thinking about what's it's gonna cost, not the assessment, but the repairs. So do you conduct an independent reserve study? And this isn't just limited to um, you know, the building and repairs to that. It could be just reserve studies in general. I was surprised 23% have not had independent reserve studies performed where they look at all of your expenses and look at, okay, what should you be setting aside every year for reserves? So the next slide will give us some insight into this as well. So this slide, it's a little tricky to understand, but the idea is, do you do it, is it structural? Do you do, do you reserve for structural degradation versus doing it for the individual elements, roof, elevator, pavers, pool equipment, resurfacing? So are you doing it for each individual item? You know, um, so kind of interesting there, how your reserves are put together. When was the last reserve study conducted? So we just had, again, this simplified, but within the last two years or over two years ago. It's tricky, you know, you're not only looking at what you should put into reserves to pay for in the future, but you're also budgeting for it. What's a roof gonna cost? How long is it gonna last? You know, what if we have a structural integrity issue with the buildings where we're gonna have to do some major work, but it's definitely worthwhile to look at those things. And if your board hasn't done it, I strongly encourage you to look at, you know, encourage them to do a reserve study as well as, even if you do have one, take a look at it and do a little sanity test on those numbers. Take a look at them and say, do I agree with how long these things are gonna you know, last? Is the roof gonna really last 50 years? <clears throat> Is it only gonna last 10 years? These are all things that you should be looking at and it doesn't really require a lot of technical expertise. A lot of this is just common sense that's layered on top of the fact that you hopefully had somebody independently that has experience with this do the reserve study. In addition to that, if you have a, manage, a property management company, they can help you and do some comparisons and suggestions with what other uh, properties that they're managing have done. 
So this is one. Does your association fully fund its reserves? 60% said yes. I think that's pretty impressive. 34% said no, 9% uncertain. There's some rounding errors here, so it doesn't quite add up to 100%. I apologize for that. Yeah, Joe, uh, this, this is a really important slide. I mean, you, we can talk about what are probably going to be the reasons for the Surfside collapse, but one of the major reasons is they weren't fully funded, and it took years for them to negotiate amongst each other in the HOA on when and, and how to pay for the projects they knew they needed to get done. So if you aren't fully funded, that's going to delay the process probably for you to go on and get the uh, structural work uh, performed just to uh, you know, get your building up to code. So this is really important to stress that you should fully fund your reserves. Uh, we can talk about a lot of the reasons, but the biggest reason was the association's failure to fully implement the changes uh, and structural repairs that needed to be done. Now, the, the other, other thing that I've, I, I, I think we should all look at is we do have a lot of the similar type of, of issues that Surfside has on a lot of our condos is we have these elevated pool decks that a lot of them have parking underneath. And that's exactly what Surfside was. And what was one cause of this collapse was over time, sometime you know, after the building was built, they put these large planters up on the pool deck, probably to get shade from trees, and they overloaded the structural system, uh, which is down in the parking garage. So if, if you have association uh, members who have large planters that were put in maybe after the building was built, you really need the engineers to look at those because you may be overloading the structural elements below. Um, I know that I see on, on, on the newer uh, pool renovations, they do lightweight aluminum trellises for shade or, or you do a lightweight um, fabric type shade awnings that, that stretch out over your pool deck. I would tell you to really rethink putting trees up on your pooled elevated pool decks. They just add a lot of weight and they probably are gonna add a lot of moisture because they could leak down in your structural system. So be very careful um, and get that out to your mm -hmm. membership if you could. Because those are that is one of the causes of this collapse is they overloaded their structural system and didn't do the repairs to the columns below. Hey Joe, it's Matthew, hey, Joe, it's Matthew Oaks at Gulf Towers. Uh, can you help define this slide a little bit more when you say fully fund its reserves? When, when, we're ref, when we're referring to that, obviously there's a lot of different segments that need to be fully funded. So what it, is it defined by the number of residents, the square footage? Like when we start thinking of a macro number to have in an overall reserve, what's the guidance on that? So... I would say it's less about that and more about having a reserve study that builds from the ground up. Right. What are the things that need to be replaced, right? Putting it on an, a, a spreadsheet that figures out, okay, it, what's the lifespan of this particular item? So the roof, plumbing, you know, structural issues, uh, it could be anything as simple as pavers, you know, pool equipment. So you put that all on a spreadsheet, you figure out when your big expenses are, and you figure out, okay, based on this, how much do we need to set aside each year to fund these big projects? And in some cases, you may have a situation where you have some real bumps in terms of certain years, you've got some major, major expenses, right? Uh, because your roof is coming due, or some other very expensive project is coming due. In other years, you don't have that much, but the point is you do those calculations with the idea of having it funded so that over time, you don't have to do special assessments and you're able to more or less fund it. You know, you may have to 
delay some cosmetic things like maybe pool furniture has to stay for another couple of years or the grills don't get replaced as quickly in the interest of taking care of the things that are not cosmetic that do have to be replaced. Thanks. Okay. But it, it's really about building that financial model. And again, that's where a independent study can come in handy and they can give you that spreadsheet. And I would certainly encourage you to debate that among your board members, especially I'm sure many, many properties have people <clears throat> that have backgrounds in construction and can help you know assess this. And like I said, a lot of it's just common sense. Do we really believe the roof is going to last that long or that short a period of time? You know, those sort of things. Is the roof going to cost that much? And sometimes you might want to do a sanity check and say, what would it cost if we tried to replace a roof today? And this is, again, goes back to the collaboration idea that Doug talked about. We should be talking amongst ourselves. Hey, you just replaced your roof. How much did it cost? You know, sharing that information. We're not, you know, direct competitors where we're, you know, we're, we've got some sort of NDA and we don't want to tell, you know, somebody else what we paid for something. There's benefits in terms of, like I said, doing that check on whether you're funding your reserves enough. Let me share with you for two seconds where we are, because uh, we were fortunate enough to have Gulf View property management with Gulf Towers. And we're right now going through a complete building structural renovation. So we're two buildings north of the Edgewater. And we were fortunate enough, Spectrum is the contractor along with TRC Engineering. And we elected to have our, the paint, all the paint off the building stripped and then have the, the core structural tests with TRC. And we're going through tie beam replacement. I mean, this project was originally slated for five months and probably about $400,000. We're now into month 10 and probably headed north of a million by the time we get done, but we'll be completely structurally rehabilitated um, from the ground up with the entire structure by the time we finish. And it was because we stripped the building and found all the extra damage um, that was in the stucco. And they got, we also had it, we had the entire building, Horizon Construction Materials came in and scanned the entire structure with a radar scanning gun, right? And the tie beams and everything. So we elected to go that path. We had an assessment last year that was significant, not knowing we'd run in to the damage and the fixes that we're having to put in place now. And we'll likely have another one, but then we'll be caught up. So it's uh, if anybody wants to come down and take a look at what we're doing, let me know, um, because it's a significant restructure overhaul of the entire complex. I hope some of, some of the people on the call will take you up on that. Um... So this next slide just asks the question, I think I used skip logic for this. So some of you might not have seen this question if you said you fully funded your reserves, but um, you know, traditional, well, owners prefer to invest individually and they'll just pay the special assessments when they're due, but sometimes those special assessments could be pretty significant. And all it takes is a few owners that don't have the funds and you're kind of, it's easier now with the economy up and real estate prices up to justify it. But, you know, when we went through the tough period where there were people that were falling behind on everything from mortgage payments to their condo fees, not such a good time to do special assessments. And that's where having strong reserves comes in handy. And, you know, sometimes it also, you know, discourages people that can't really afford to buy a place to buy a place. You don't want somebody that can't afford it, you know, and then you're not funding your reserves and then all of a sudden you have to do a special assessment and they can't pay for it. So, you know, you've got the 7% that said, hey, we're trying to do it. We need to get to it, but we're weighing it and, you know, trying to come to a, a reasonable approach to it. Uh, yeah, Joe, I, I think I think Matthew, Matthew makes a good point. I mean, in his project, you start out and you think you know what it's going to cost, but once you get in there and look at what what you have, it's probably going to cost you more. So you really need to think about having uh, 
some uh, monies in there to uh, take care of that if you go over budget. And uh, that could be 50%. I mean, and that's what it is with these structural uh, 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 repair jobs. It's just, it's, it's very difficult to know what's, what's hidden until you find it. Yeah, so, you know, owners vote against it every year. Owners waive full funding. Um, you know, and then you have this, I believe that definition of fully fund will be looked at. And that's something that's worth looking at again. That's where having an independent study might give you some ammunition to sway people over and get them thinking more seriously about it. You know, it's a fine line. Obviously, nobody wants to be unpopular with high fees or raising your fees, your quarterlies. But the flip side to it is if you're not funding it properly, at some point you're going to have a rude awakening. Craig, do you want to add any other comments? You kind of commented throughout, but yeah, um, I, I just want to give you an update um, to um, what we're going to see maybe in the rules and regulations and state law. Uh, I think they're, they're back at work in Tallahassee, and uh, I'm sure they're going to be debating this. Uh, I think the direction is going to be the same as before. They're going to uh, use the ICC, which is the International Code Council's uh, property maintenance code changes, and they're going to incorporate them into the Florida Building Code property maintenance. And that's going to include some type of uh, required uh, structural assessments and inspections on a certain time frame. Because like I said, it could be 25 years, it could be 30, it could be 20, it could be 40, uh, or every five years after a certain date. I think we're going to see that. Uh, I don't think anybody knows where we're going to get on that un until they go in there and they debate. Um, and as far as making it required, I don't think we're going to we're going to see that it's going to be required. Um, I think it's going to be left up to each municipality to take that uh, property maintenance code and make it law. I don't think we're going to see a broad oversweep of legislation that the governor is going to sign that says. Everyone and everywhere in the state of Florida is going to have to do these structural assessments on a certain time frame. I don't. I just don't think our governor uh, is going to do that. So I, I just don't think we're going to go there. So it's going to come down to every municipality. Um, so I think uh, we're going to have to probably take this in front of council at some point once we we see what's going to happen and. Typically, there are laws in Tallahassee take effect July 1st, October 1st of the same year. This one may be stretched out. It may be stretched out to July 1st of next year or October 1st of next year to give everyone at least a year's notice on, on what they may want to do uh, because it's going to have to go back to each municipality. That's how I see it. So once we get those laws uh, down from Tallahassee, we'll, we'll be taking it probably to the city of council. And I'm sure the city council will want everyone's input on whether this should be a rule and law in, in, in Naples. So I think we'll look forward to, to having some good debate on that. And that's, I think, the direction that we're going to go. I think that it is, of course, the importance of the associations, both GSEC and uh, GSBOA, uh, and also the people up in Vanderbilt, uh, the, the number of high rises that are involved are all in our district. It's never on the homeowner, it's on a, the buildings. And I think that we really have to be together on this thing and understand what our responsibilities are and what we can do to make sure that our buildings are safe. That's, that's correct. Um, so I, I think, you know, this, the council is gonna need everyone's input and it's gonna have to be everyone coming together to either back this or or not, but I, I, it seems to me this is what needs to be done. So I guess we'll have to see how the process um, plays out. So lots to think about there. Um, obviously, it's another argument for funding your reserves and making sure that you're budgeting appropriately. You want to be frugal, but at the same time, you don't want to be 
saving so much money that you have a disaster like what happened in Miami with that Surfside building or where you have a situation where you have a huge assessment. Yeah, that's correct, Joe. I will keep you, your group informed with, with what I find out uh, from the process in, in Tallahassee. And I'll definitely pass that on to Doug as soon as I get something and GSAC and anybody else that I can pass it on to. But until then, um, thanks for having me today and have a great Christmas and happy new year. Uh, before Thank you go, much. Craig, before you go, Craig, does anybody have any final question for Craig? Again, he is building inspector. So he is the man that comes out and inspects um, after the permits have been issued and after the construction's done. <coughs> anybody? No. I have a request. Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, Craig, can you share with us some recommended people that you would suggest we contact for inspection? Yeah, I mean, we see Forge doing a lot of this work. Yeah, we've been using Forge. Yep, uh, Stantec probably can do it. Um, Universal, uh, American Structural, I believe, does it. Um, those are probably the four that we see most often. Okay, we'll, we'll make sure that that goes into the uh, website as well so we can give that information to our members. Thank you. Yeah, take, take a look them up. Some are in the process of changing their names because they're being, the engineering firms are very uh, volatile or not right now. There's international groups buying these firms up. And, and so some are changing in the process of changing their names. I know that Forge was just purchased and so was Universal, I think. but they're still keeping their old names for now. Anything else? Hey, thank you again, Craig. Okay, thank you. Have a great holiday. You, you know, too, as, best as Christmas. As always, we're not trying to give you legal advice. We're not trying to give you financial advice. And even with what Craig uh, said, we're not endorsing, and I'm sure <laughs> Craig isn't specifically endorsing those particular companies, those are starting points for you. You have to do your own due diligence and your own research, but at least that gets you a starting point, so. Yep, that's correct, Joe. Okay, everybody take care. Thank you so much. Have Thank a happy again. holiday. So anybody have anything else they wanna add? Al uh, chatted some things in there. Okay. Let's move on to new business then. Doug, I'm going to throw it to you on the Manor House buyout. Okay, Manor House. Um, I don't know how many of you have been watching this Manor House. It is not closed. It won't close for some time. But right now, the deal on the table is somewhere north of $130 million to buy the Manor House property, which sits just north of Laudermill Park. Okay, um, I'm sorry, it's Ma it's Mansion House, it's not Manor Mansion. House. Yeah, how did that happen? Wow. I'm sorry, <laughs> Mansion House. Uh, thank you, Al. Uh, but the, uh, the Mansion House property is north of 130 million. We think it may be between 130 and $150 million. And the property is a wonderful piece of property. How was it? Your hair looks great. How we do like it. Uh oh. <laughs> Please mute yourself. We don't need to know about hair style. Yeah, what I'll say, she cut her way back. Good for you. Looks good. Good. Oh my God. Uh, George? I just muted him. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, uh, the, the deal is uh, including a buyout of the land lease. So the land lease is in the number. And we don't know what that represents in terms of the total cost. The um, mansion house is a, only 30 units in the mansion house. And uh, whatever is left over after the buying out of the, uh, of the land lease will be ben ben benefiting the 30 owners of the property. It's a wonderful deal for the property. It's probably a wonderful deal for the boulevard. And I'm sure that whatever is going in there is going to be wonderful, beautiful condominiums. 
Any thoughts or comments or questions? How high can they go uh, uh, on that property? How many stories can they go? It's not a question of stories because the height of each story is governed by the height of the ceiling on each level. So let's suppose we have 12 foot ceilings and that could be eight stories high, maximum of approximately a hundred feet. And that is generally the, the, the uh, zoning limit uh, along Gulf Shore Boulevard, both sides. No, yeah, on, our side, on the other side, it's three stories. No, it's not. No, it's not. Kingsport building, as an example, is 85 feet. Yeah. I was going to say, I believe right. that the zoning is 87 feet, although the Athens group did get significant um, deviations from that. But, you know, it's the height. You also have to consider the lot coverage. Uh, Mansion House does have quite a bit of space. So, you know, they could probably build something pretty significant. But at the same time, hopefully they'll have setbacks and they won't have crazy lot coverage. And it's also the density, you know, how many units can you put in that space? So all of those things impact. And so when you said three stories, it could be that the lot size was such that that was the most dense, you know, that they could go. The um, Al, Al Hillage, are you still there? Al? Al just texted 84 feet above the 100 year mean water mark plus five feet for mechanicals. And that's on a, a chat message from Al. Um, and that makes sense. That's the height, the height limitation. Uh, whatever it is, Mansion House is gonna push that limit, I'm sure, uh, with the new buildings that they'll put up there. And we're all gonna be governed by it. And I expect that we're all gonna be seeing more of this as we go through it. If you think about the fact that the Naples Beach Hotel sold for $385 billion with their square, with their footprint and their, their, their lineage of their, their footage on the, on the water, um, it makes Mansion House a very, very attractive deal. So um, it's gonna be interesting. We're in interesting times and all of us will see that over the years. Um, next on the agenda is the, before I leave that, is there any other questions? Comments. Comments. NCH proposed medical campus. We heard Craig talk about that briefly before. This is approximately a 24 acre piece of property that mostly is currently owned by NCH. And they wanna develop that and they wanna build a large tall building there, approximately a hundred feet as I understand it. <laughs> and that is for uh, a new heart center that uh, is planned. Uh, anybody have any further information on that? Okay, hearing none, let's go on to Art District. The Art District is running along uh, 41 on along Tamiami Trail. <clears throat> and it's going up from 7th Avenue North all the way up uh, from downtown all the way up to 7th Avenue North. And they're going to be uh, encompassing 10th Street as well. And uh, it's a, a really interesting project. And if uh, you'd like, I'll be more than happy to post a link to that and a link to the uh, discussions that are going on. I'm sure some of you have already been heard of it and have been involved in the discussions about that. Any comments on the art district? Naples City Council debate. We have a debate. And, and Gulf Shore Property Owners is a sponsor of the debate together with uh, the uh, other groups, including uh, Moorings Property Owners and Coquina Sands, which we are all members of indirectly. The uh, Gulf Shore Property Owners is going to be on uh, the debate on January 6th, between five and 7 p.m. Uh, on the slide that you're looking at, all of the sponsors are there. And uh, we're asking you to bring your visions of what you want in the city of Naples over the coming years. Um, there will be uh, all of the members of the correction, all of the candidates 
the five candidates, which we saw a picture just a moment ago, uh, together with Jeff Lytle, who will do the Q&A and uh, will basically ask the members to uh, respond to questions that are preset. And then they're all gonna have an opportunity to speak their own message that they want to uh, tell us from the, uh, from the podium. Uh, the, uh, that's, the, that's the screen. Terry and Terry Hutchinson and Ray Crispin are currently sitting members of the council. John, Beth, and Ian are aspiring to become members. There are three open seats. You will be asked to pick three of the five when you go to vote on February 1st or sooner by mail. Uh, can we move ahead to the next slide? Yeah, let me just go back one more slide though, if I can. Okay. Um, so just some key do dates for those of you that vote in Florida, be sure to register for vote if you're not set up to register for it. December 30th is when vote for mallets will start to be sent. But again, you have to ask for that. January 3rd is the last day to register to vote. January 22nd, not to confuse you, is the last day to request for a vote by mail ballot, okay? So January 3rd, you got to register to vote. That's your deadline. January 22nd, request to vote. And early voting will be January 26th through the 29th. And the last day to vote or election day here in Naples for the council is February 1st. And the one thing that I will say that I really want to emphasize to you is, unfortunately, the turnout is usually not that large because it's an off year. You're not voting for president. You're not even voting for Congress or Senate. So as a consequence, with it being February 1st, your vote really, really counts. You know, uh, these, these elections could be really close and just, uh, you know, 100 votes here or there could make the difference in terms of who goes into the city council. So I encourage you, as does Doug, as much as you can, try to, that January 6th is likely to be live streamed. GSAC's going to have one before that. Old Naples will. A lot of these are going to be live streamed, so you won't even have to leave your place if you want to just look at it on YouTube or some other place. There'll be information coming on that. So look for that. And if you can attend in person, great. But if you can't, you're good to go, you know, viewing it online. Uh, the Association of Homeowners, back, back one slide. Uh, go back to the other two. The Association of Homeowners, which I which are listed here, <clears throat> have requested that you do not wear campaign shirts or hats if you're attending the, the uh, live debate, and please be courteous and respectful. And that's that's the way we want everything in Naples: courteous and respectful. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. Hang on a second. Communication with other members and the city and the county. I think we pretty much covered that in collaboration. But again, we need to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, send me an email. If that's something that I can answer, I will answer it. If it's something that I can hang out to the rest of the community, I'll be more than happy to do that on your behalf. And if you want your, your name confidential, I'll be more than happy to keep your name as confidential. Again, you can post it on the website. Joe, you have any instructions on posting on the website? Um, it's relatively easy to go to the website. You can register. Doug, myself, can approve you relatively quickly. So if you haven't been registered on the website, very easy to do. And you simply are able to post things. Obviously, we want to make sure that we don't end up with a lot of garbage on the website. So we will look at the names to get a sense as to, okay, is this a name that we recognize as being in our community? Um, but it's pretty straightforward on the website. It's a simple website, but we are posting information on there for you. It's a good website. It, um, it's a little tricky to get on and do the signing. And once you're signed in and once you're approved to, to use a website, which is just a moment of, or two of Joe's time, uh, we'll be more than happy to take it off from there. Uh, COVID precautions and update. Uh, I'm gonna open this up for discussion to get with the open forum. Uh, do many of you have COVID precautions 
or suggestions to wear masks in common areas and things like that? Uh, do you still do any of that? Uh, please respond. Unmute yourself and respond, please. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. No, I have to say I'm Pat Leona from Colonial Club. No, I have to say that we have not done anything more um, as of last year. I don't know. I, th I think everybody in our building has been vaccinated, and I think any family or friends coming are vaccinated, but... Jeez, I'll, I'm open for any suggestions. Okay, so you're not requiring masking in common areas? No. No, okay, thank you. Hey, hey Doug, it's Matthew at Bell Towers. So in our last board meeting, the owners uh, collectively decided to uh, mask in common areas. Um, also, uh, no guests in the club room, restricted to owners or runners only. And then also, um, uh, no, no, no. We're not. We're not allowing gatherings of more than six people in the building. More than, more than six. Is that what you said? That's correct. Wow. Okay. Is your building. Excuse me. Uh, how big is your building? How many suites do you have? We're, it's golf towers. It's two buildings north of the Edgewater Beach. We're seven stories and thirty-six units. Okay, because our building is uh, well, eighteen units. My husband and I own two, so basically seventeen owners. Um, Owners were unanimous in that, just because uh, we have we have an elderly population that travels primarily from the Midwest, and they wanted. Now that's in place. Now that means it won't. I don't know that that won't change upon request when we meet in December and January. But that's what's been in place for the last six months. Yeah, interesting. I will bring it up with the rest of our board. Hmm. Hey, anybody else have any thoughts about what they're building as a? And we're at Kingsport Club, which is on the other side of the street, on the uh, bay side of the street, right uh, at the end of uh, uh, Gulf Shore Boulevard as it becomes Mooring Line Drive. And our building is a seven-story building with 30, 35, 35 units, uh, three penthouses and 32 other two-bedroom units. And we do require masking of all owners and guests in common areas and especially contractors. And we do generally try to leave this up to their own individual honor. So we don't have to, don't check them. We basically hope they just do it. And most of our people have been able to do it. We do limit uh, groups in our club room uh, to 12 people. And we do, uh, we started limiting uh, people at the pool and then we stopped that. Uh, because we felt the pool was sufficiently outdoors that it was not necessary. Uh, we're going to we meet every month, and every month we discuss this, and every month we are uh, talking with the uh, uh, the board and uh, also the membership in terms of how the restrictions and how the uh, requirements can be changed if necessary. Generally speaking, they've been left in place for the last six months. Uh, I saw just a saw a note from Al. Just a minute, let me pull it up. Al said, "No compliance with either Park Place Club or Park Colony." So he's saying no requirement for masking or anything else. Is that correct, Al? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next. Uh, any any other comments? Any other unit owners or building uh, board members like to comment? Any thoughts? Hi. This is gonna go on for months. Years. <laughs> now, 2022 is gonna be a male entity. Um, hi, I, I couldn't log in at the beginning. So um, can anyone give me a quick update on what's happening with the Athens Group and Naples Beach Hotel, or are we just sick and tired of hearing about it? We will give you, um, we, we, we recorded this session, so you'll be able to okay. go to YouTube and see it. And we do have slides as well that kind of highlight the two things, the fact that the sale took place and, the fa and just 
what was going on legally on October 5th. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ifs, ands, and buts. Who knows what the heck's going to go on? <laughs> the fact that they closed on it and the fact that they've emptied out the hotel tells you enough to know that it's moving forward. Yeah. We will send uh, the copy of the slides, which include the uh, Naples Beach Hotel uh, update to, to all of the uh, members of the association. So they'll be coming out to all of you as soon as Joe and I get a all straightened out and get it off to you probably in the next day or two. Um, quickly, is the beach project finished now? As far as bringing all the sand in, is it done? Pat, what are you, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Oh, is the beach uh, refurbishment finished with the sand? Uh, our portion of it is, yes. Unfortunately, some of it's already been washed away, but yes, it's finished. <laughs> Uh, yeah. The uh, the beach replenishment right now that's being done is up in Vanderbilt. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we're right just south of Loudermilk, and I do see some trucks every so often. They've done a great job, but I think, sadly, you're right. <laughs> you know, with the tide and whatever, sand's going to disappear. Oh, time and tide. Yeah. And with that said, time and tide waits for no man. I'm waiting for a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll say let's adjourn. All right, do I have a second? Thank you. Pat, you're really not a board member, but you could be. Oh, I'm not a board member. Oh, Jesus, I'm the you're board just, member of Colonial Club. No, thank you. I don't need any no. more. <laughs> Come on now. We need some more board members here. Oh, my God. Okay, so I'll take that back. No, no. <laughs> Maxine Lewis, here. can I have a motion to adjourn? I'm so moved. We adjourn the meeting. Okay, Duncan, can I have a second? Thank you. I'll second okay. it, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right. Thank you all very much for coming. All in favor of adjournment? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you again. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks.